good. I was coming yeah. for a whole walk in. Oh, oh man, okay, okay. We got we got the walk in. Did you walk okay, the music too? Yeah. Okay, like, you know, come dancing in. Stone Cold so. Steve Austin music. <laughs> All right, so uh, <laughs> we're gonna do this alphabetically. Vince Manfredi is uh, the interim mayor of Maricopa and is advertising advertising director and current owner of then Maricopa. Uh, council member Rich Vidiello is the general manager of Cool Mine Plumbing. And we're going before we uh, give these guys a chance to tell you why they uh, they're running, I want to go over a few ground rules for the debate tonight, or not the debate, but for the town hall tonight. Uh, there are no time limits, however, uh, I will interject when ideas are being repeated or we're falling off topic. Uh, questions can be taken from people present at the event or on Facebook Live. Uh, questions can be addressed to a single candidate or everybody. Candidates will be allowed to answer a question addressed to, other can to another candidate, but it's not required. Uh, all questions will be accepted except those that are repetitive or inappropriate. Uh, candidates will be able to question one another. So, on that note, let's uh, we'll start with Vince. You can give your uh, two-minute introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. My name is Vince Manfredi. I'm currently serving as one of your city council members, then vice mayor, and now I get to be interim mayor with Christian Price moving on. So, we'll pick a new vice mayor and, and mayor and all that stuff in the next coming months. Um, we still have to come up with the exact way we'll do that. But um, again, my name is Vince. I've been your council member now for almost eight years. I'm running for re-election because I've been working on a whole lot of stuff, doing a whole lot of things that I want to see to completion. You know, one of my main things that I work on, of course, is transportation. I love um, getting out there and speaking with people throughout the state on transportation issues and working to hopefully get a fix to the 347. Today's news, or technically yesterday's news, but our news is a little bit dampered, of course, because of what happened in Maricopa County, so it hurts a little bit, uh, because as you know, half of 347 rests in Maricopa County, and Doug Ducey just vetoed their ability to have their sales tax, and that pays for all the roads that, get, that happen in Maricopa County. So it's a lot of work ahead of us, um, I'm prepared for the work. I want to do the work and I want to stay on city council. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Council member Rich Fidiello, thank you for all for coming again. And if you come and keep coming back, please. So you have a little something by on your chairs of both of us there. It'll tell you a little bit about me if there's things that aren't uh, asked tonight. So I stand before you today asking you for a job for four more years. So this is your interview for me. Please ask what you want to ask. I'm here to answer your questions. We're here to work for you, and we do know that we work for you. Public safety is one of my biggest things. Safe city is gonna bring jobs. Economic development and jobs are job one and job two. Safety and economic development. Of course, the 347, as Vince mentioned, it is 100% on our scope. You know it took 15 years to build an overpass. Well, guess what? It probably takes a little longer to build 15 miles of road. We're working on it. We constantly work on it. We go to ADOT meetings. We show up. We tell our stories. Some of the stories are not very good. But we do work together as a team with the uh, ADOT and all the other entities that are involved. There's four, uh, four other entities. So we work together. We try to make sure that we uh, could bring this to up uh, for us and we look forward to bringing this and widening it and making sure that everybody can leave our city safely. But the important thing is if we bring jobs here, they don't have to be job driving up there. Thank you. All right, uh, before we uh, take questions from the crowd, I would uh, like to uh, let the, uh, the Facebookers who are uh, joining in right now, uh, some of them may be joining a little late, let them know that we're missing two candidates. Uh, Henry Wade had to uh, had to step away because he had a family emergency earlier this afternoon, and uh, Adam Leach had to also step away because we were in the middle of giving our uh, I saw it right there myself. We were giving the uh, the description and the ground rules for the town hall, and he got a call right there and had to had to leave. So uh, that's why those two are missing right now. So I guess I will ask the crowd: Does anybody have any questions? And 
<laughs> my request is uh, make sure I come to you with a uh, with a microphone so everybody on Facebook can hear you. Good evening, my name is Tina Jigen. My question is why the city has not done a third party employee survey recently. I understand there are some very unhappy employees and I'm curious how the council would handle that. Thank you. So, so Tina, that's a great question. Um, I've never heard any disgruntled employees. I am in there frequently enough to talk with people. Maybe they don't believe we're the people to come to because we don't hire them or fire them. We only hire and fire a couple people. But I told you last time uh, that, that I would actually go and ask that question and it has been brought up and we're going to see what's going to happen with that. It's actually a great thing. I interview my employees every six months or should say, uh, raise time I should say. So maybe our maybe our city employees should do the same thing with our managements. And I agree with you. Thanks. More questions? Oh I see I see a few. I think I saw your hand first. Oh yeah. My name is Susan Coy. I've been living in Maricopa since uh, February of 2007. I witnessed the bubble burst in 2008. I'm endured Asher in Maricopa. I started in December. I was surprised to see all the new builds in this town. So I've seen a slowdown because of the stagflation we're in in this country. And I'm just a little concerned. They're just gonna kind of sit there and not be finished or people going in and vandalizing. Just wanted to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, Su Susan, right? Yeah, Susan, great question. And I moved here in 2010, and I stole a house from the bank who took it from someone else, and I did really well by buying a house back in 2010. So we came here during that time when the housing prices were so low. There's a big difference between today and what happened back then, right? Back then, uh, they were just building houses out of spec. You didn't even have to show your paycheck to get a loan. It was crazy times, and people can get a loan for $300,000 with just saying you made money. You didn't even have to prove it. So it was different then than it is today. And you're gonna see a slowdown. I've been talking to a couple of people, a couple of realtors, a couple of mortgage folks, and you're gonna see a slowdown, and the slowdown is not gonna lower prices, I don't think. It's just gonna go up a little bit slower than we've seen over the last couple of years. And houses are selling pretty fast still, um, very fast actually. You know, you're not gonna have a house sitting in my house before I purchased it. It was on the market for over a year. So that's not gonna happen, I don't think, right? But I am, I mean, if I had a, uh, what's it was, uh, crystal ball, I would, you know, I'd be rich right now, but unfortunately I'm not. He is <laughs> But no, um, I don't see that being an issue. I do see there's gonna be an issue with the gig economy, which you're a part of. Um, and that kind of economy is gonna hurt because people had extra money and they would call and get food delivered all the time. And then, you know, the extra $5, you're like, oh, who cares? Right? But now when you look at gas prices at $5 or you know maybe $6 anytime soon, or it could drop down a little bit in money, but in the $5 range, Five dollars is a lot of money. It's a gallon of gas. So it's a little bit different. And you're gonna see the gig economy, I think, will slow. Less people will go out, less people will be buying out, because that's always the first thing that gets hit. Except for the um, next pandemic that may be coming up, maybe yeah. a lockdown. Yeah. We may be busy because of fear and they don't want to go out of their houses. Yep. Too. That could happen. Thank you. you All right, next question. No. Can I answer that too? Is that all right if I just give it quick? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, as you heard, I'm a general manager of a plumbing company here. I built the hospital here. I've built the animal hospital. I've built several buildings here in the city. Uh, not me personally, I have helped. But part of the slowdown is actually happening due to product. Mm -hmm. Product has gone through the roof. So some of these builders are actually, I have to say, pretty smart. When a restaurant wants to open, he wants to open, I have to build it. I have to build it and I have to raise its prices because every time they change something, prices go up and up. So that's part of the problem why there is a slowdown. Lumber is a problem. Lumber has not dropped. Copper is through the roof. Pex is through the roof. A, a quote that I gave three months ago has gone up 30% from then. And from then, from prior, um, I'm doing a house, a hotel 
in Chandler, and I've raised it over $128,000 in six months. Product's gone through the roof. So that's the majority of the slowdown. People want to buy houses. So. All right, now for the next question. to the city and I did buy my house back in 2018 before there was an overpass so when I moved back I was very impressed to see that on that honey pet um, but I have just um, a little frustrated that at this point with this many people and this much building going on where's Home Depot where's Lowe's who's working on that great question very <laughs> simply answered I'm sure you get asked all the time as you know, the city uh, council members, we do go to meetings, we do talk to, we go to a show called the ICSC show. Unfortunately, uh, this year was virtual. We weren't gonna bother going to it because it's a waste of time virtually. And the year before, obviously due to the pandemic. So we actually solicit ourselves. We actually go to these shows every year and we sell our city, okay? Is there a Home Depot coming? No. Mm, maybe. Is there a Lowe's coming? Mm, maybe. Are we working on it? Yes. Are we working on every other type of restaurant you want, that you want, that you want? Yes, we are working on these. But we also deal, we have two companies that we have that we work with. One's called MEDA that the city funds. It's a Maricopa Economic Development Alliance. What they do is, the mayors, that's the new mayor position, by the way. He's the new uh, president and CEO. He is the one who's out going to go out and get big businesses, tech companies, things like that. We go and we meet with companies all the time. Uh, as a council, we all do it together, we work together. But yes, these things are coming. I've been here since 2005. I was during the crash, and then I stole a house in Cobblestone. Literally stole a $700,000 house for $214,000. So we could benefit from it. I'm happy I did, I live in it, I'll never sell it. It's a basement home. They're gonna bury me in that basement. But just like I said, so part of the question also was um, that we do work hard for you. We do go out there and uh, we pay, like I said, and we have another company called GPAC. They're a marketing firm. What they do is they do the same thing that Mita does. There is some overlap, but the difference is Mita works just for us. GPAC works for the whole entire state. And they're very well respected. And Christian Price has all the connections. So this was a great job for Christian Price, our former mayor, and our new mayor here, that uh, it's a great job for him to work at, and he'll bring some great businesses. It's hard because Rich and I work really well together. Our council works really well together. Our current council is probably the greatest council that I've served on in terms of the people and the work that we do. We all have our strengths, and we work towards those strengths, and we help each other to do things like work to bring places like uh, Home Depot and Lowe's and a lot of retail but retail really follows rooftops right so the more rooftops the more retail comes just south of the tracks on that dirt right across from the hospital there's going to be a large retail development there but it's funny as rich mentioned how much it's costing to um bring in um the what was it the hotel up in chandler and how costs keep going up well the same thing's happening for retail so the cost keeps going up so somebody like say I'm not saying they're coming here, but somebody like a Target, right? They want to pay about seven dollars a square, a linear foot, right, for them to build on something, and that's just not available right now. Five years ago, that was available in Maricopa, a plethora of it, and now there's not that much of it left. So when you look at it, the prices prices are going up, and that's going to hold back a lot of retail or make retail smaller than it wants to be. So there's a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of pushing and prodding and dragging and and we'll get there and we'll have a lot of the stores people want i mean marshall's is opening up and a lot of new restaurants are opening up over the course of the next 18 months we'll probably have another 10 restaurants in the city of maricopa than you have today and it's just going to keep coming and coming because the people are going to keep coming and coming because we love it here and i know right we're like oh no i don't want more people but we love it here and it's hard for us to say it's hard for you to say you can't come to the next person 
He's like, I got mine, you can't come, right? So people want to be here, developers want to build here, so we're going to keep growing. And it's just smart economic growth is what we need to do. Thanks. Okay, more questions? Go ahead. Hello, and Mr. Manfredi, I don't need it. Facebook needs it, so they can hear you. They can hear me fine, okay? No, it's online, so they can hear you online. Uh, I'm speaking that, they can right. hear you online. Since you both work on transportation issues, why is it that Mr. Montello, about two weeks ago, got a council meeting with Mr. Wade, complaining about Porter Road and the parents picking children up but yet, nothing was addressed in the developments with Santa Rosa, Pima Butte, and Butterfield Elementary. That's the same issue that you have on Porter. What is the issue? Will it be addressed after the summer? It's being addressed literally as I spoke two weeks ago. So, the city is working with each individual school for a traffic plan, okay? The traffic plans have to be given to us, us approve them, and then make sure that we hold those schools accountable. That's the majority of the problem. A lot of the problem is, I, again, I, I happened to drop my grandson off at Heritage, and I said this two weeks ago, that I see a lot of this going on. And I don't know if you know what this means. This means I'm looking at, and there's a gap of ten, five, six, seven cars in front of each other. If those lines were shortened up, now, I don't have every single answer for you. They're going to, each school is going to bring their suggestions on how we can fix this traffic on Porter Road. Now, how about the developments that are already established? Okay, so first of all, I don't know if you know, but in the state of Arizona, I can't say, yes, you can come, but no, you can't come. Plain and simple. The developer owns the land. We don't own the land. No, I'm not we, talking about that. Ms. Manfrey knows that I complained about the parents and the bike lane, no parking, no standing, no stopping. Okay. And it goes on constantly at Pima Butte, Butterfield, and Santa Rosa. And according to the signs on the road, according to the signs on the road, that is illegal. Okay. And when I asked your local police department, they said, well, call another not emergency number. Well, in other words, to help with you. Sure, I got you. And bottom line, and bottom line is, it's like something out of your life. Get over, it. like with you with uh, Porter Road. It's only an hour of your life. Get over. It. I said that. No. Thank you. I okay. was told by I was told by an HOA president. It's only an hour. Get over. Okay. It. First, 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 first of all, as you know, I have no jurisdiction over what your HOA president, manager, or anybody said. We are two separate sub sanctioning bodies. But that's why I said the traffic plan is very important. I agree with you, the bike lanes are for bicycles, okay? Uh, that's why we are gonna get the traffic plan and we are going to, we just hired, just to let you guys know, we just hired four new officers and there's six more on the way. A lot of these are gonna be for traffic, okay? So I can't solve the problem right now for you, but can I tell you, for the last three months minimum, that's been something that we were working on. And our city manager, when he gets his mind on something, he gets it done. And guess what? The council holds him accountable to make sure this gets done. And we'll be a part of that also. So if you want an answer right this second, I can't give it to you. But before school starts, we're going to have, which is actually about another, what, two weeks, three weeks, school starts? So we're working on this, um, and it's not something we just said, I know I didn't say it to you, or none of us said it to you, hell with you. But we care about you, we understand. I have a business right over there. So, I understand. Thanks, do you have anything, man? Yeah, thanks, good question. Um, when you look at the traffic on Porter Road, it's abysmal, it's horrible, um, for about an hour in the morning, hour in the afternoon, right? And we have to make sure that we mitigate it. And we're working with the schools on Porter Road today to make sure that's taken care of when school opens up in the next two weeks. Um, actually, people in Glenwell just got a notice from their, um, I guess from their HOA, I'm not sure if it was HOA. Oh, from Saddleback. Saddleback, Saddleback. Saddleback. Saddleback sent it out saying that there'll be some changes to the, to the direction and the patterns in which they're gonna go. Um, and then the other schools are working on it too. I met with Heritage a couple weeks ago with Nancy and, and Mayor Price at the time. Um, so we spoke about uh, that with Heritage and how to 
get them get people off of Porter. Now, when you you're asking not just the ones on Porter, but all the other schools, the Santa Rosa School, which is not on Porter, and other schools, and there are the same problems there. They're just not as prominent, right? Because they're not on a main artery road, right? But they are there are people parking in the in the bike lanes and in where they're not supposed to, and. We were just talking to our city manager the other day, and one of the things he's working on is, is sort of a restructuring or reorganization of the police department that will have our first ever traffic division. So the traffic division, their role will be to work on traffic situations. We do not have that in place right now. And that's something that will be in place in the near future. So a lot of those problems are going to be fixed and mitigated, as well as some of the other problems that you see on the John Wayne Parkway and throughout Honeycutt and Smith and Smith Inky with some of the speeding and the reckless driving. Now, unfortunately, we can't do anything on the 347 outside of town, really. That comes down to Hill River and ADOT. Well, Department of Public Works. Thanks. Right. No, well, Public here. Safety. All right, Vince, while you, uh, you have the floor, I'm going to ask a question from our, our Facebook audience. Sure. From Edward Michael. Oh, I know that. When do the six members of council plan to move forward in appointing a mayor from the six that are already there and interviewing citizens for the vacant position? Can you repeat the first part? When do the six members of the council plan to move forward in appointing a mayor from the six and interviewing the citizens for the vacant position? So we do not have or did not have a city council meeting this week um, because of the 4th of July. So it fell, Tuesday fell on the 5th of July, I believe it was. So we didn't have a meeting. Our next meeting, at our executive session of our next meeting, we'll have a discussion and we'll discuss that. And then we'll come up with the plan on how we will replace Mayor Price. And if if that means, because it's not certain, but if that means it's a council member, how we replace that council member. And we'll come up with those plans over time. Um, but the second meeting, of, or the first meeting of July, which is our normal second meeting, which is on the 17th, 19th, 19th sorry. It is, it's on the 19th. Um, at that meeting, we'll have an executive session and we'll discuss it. And we'll go from there on how we move forward. Do you have anything by average? Into the 19th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, guys, uh, more questions? All right. You only get one. Okay, fine. You can't get her just one. You know that. Good evening. Uh, my name is Al Waters. Uh, we moved here to Maricopa in 2018. Uh, a month after we moved here, uh, we attended our first city council meeting. And I just want to let both of you know that we were very impressed on how you guys do work together as a team. It's evident that I've attended other meetings and uh, grand openings and stuff like that. I, it's, they're all, we work like a family. So anyway, I've been following all these, the, the buzz going on with the election and re-election. And my question was actually gonna be for Mr. Leach, because I heard he made a couple of statements about there's some changes he wanted to make, but he hasn't been very clear on what he wants to change. So being that you two are here, based on your experience on what you've accomplished so far with the city council, what are some of the things that you'd like to see changed or improved? I'd love to change the 347. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you said, Al, I do appreciate that question, but we do work well together. Prior council members have worked awesome together. They're the ones who built this city. I've only been on this for four years. Vince, Nancy, Peggy, Dan Frank, they've been on before me, and they've done a great job. They've actually handed us uh, the football to keep running with. You can only accomplish stuff step by step. And think about it, the 17 years this city exists, or 18 years now, this city has grown tremendously. We are the largest city in Pinell County now, population-wise, excuse me? Yes, we are larger than Castle Grand by about 8,000 8, 8, people, roughly, right around there. Um, so if you think about it, and then the number one question we get asked all the time is, why does Castle Grand have a Home Depot, Lowe's, yeah. this, that, and other thing? <laughs> Very simple. She when, just asked it. When, exactly. when you're 102 years old, and I might be a little off on the age, but roughly 100 years old, uh, you better have something like that. So it is time. It is time. It's going to come. These things are going to come. But like I said, Prior council members have done a great job and handed me a great football for my last three and a half years that I've been here. 
And we're gonna continue to work strong as a team. We only work as a team. There is no I here. We all work together, as Vince said earlier. That's how we're gonna get things accomplished, so. I, I love change. Uh, I love it. I like changing things. Um, from the moment I, I got to the city of Maricopa, I was um, I met this guy next door to me, and I was like, we need to change this, we need to change that. He was my HOA president at the time. He was the mayor, um, or became the mayor, and now he works for Mita. Um, and we, we've been working on changing things, like simple things. I mean, putting an overpass in and stopping that, having a no, no longer stop at the Amtrak, right? Um, so those types of change. But before I ran for council, right, I served on a zoning rewrite task force. Uh, Peg served on it with me. Um, and there was, I think, 12 of us. I think it was 12 of us, 16 of us, on a zoning rewrite task force. And we spent uh, 14 months, I believe it was, working on rewriting our entire zoning code because we were living on 1960s Pinal County zoning code at the time. Yeah. So we had to rechange our entire zoning code so that we can actually grow into the city we are today. That's change, that's subs substantive, substantive, substantial change, right? And that's the stuff that we look at doing as a council and working together. But it comes from you, right, the people. And when I look at the crowd, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people, maybe too many people. My wife says I spend a little too much time on Facebook talking to people. Rich tells me, stop it. Stop talking on Facebook. Um, only because I, I'm always on there, I'm always talking. And if somebody comes to me with an idea for change and it looks like a good idea, I'll bring it to the rest of the council, I'll bring it to our city manager, and we'll talk about it. So when there is a, a chance to change things, we do work on that, and we work on it hard to get it done. Vince. That's why you're right here already talking. Yes. I have a question from uh, Facebook, Mary Grace. Yes. As our community grows, we have growth in families moving in, aging loved ones with Alzheimer's and dementia. Yes. Maricopa is lacking in support for these families and services for caregivers and patients. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself working to bring forth solutions and what will you work on? Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know if many people know it, but I lost my mother to senior dementia. Um, so it, it's a scary thing when when you look in your in your parents' eyes and they don't know who you are. I don't know if anybody's been there yet, and I pray you never are. But when you look at your mom's eyes and she has no idea who you are, it's 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 uh, it burns inside, and you'll always look for ways to try and help in that situation. Um, so at at Copper Sky. They brought to us a solution, well, a sort of a solution that will have some senior living, some hospice, um, some, some basically some assisted living, senior living, hospice care, so you can work through and have live, uh, spaces for people who want to keep their parents close. Just having apartments doesn't really help, and need, you need that assisted care because an apartment is great, but to somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, it's it's not. They have to be close to family or in a place where they can get the, meat, the help they need. So yeah, we'll, we'll always work, and if, if anybody knows a business that wants to come here and, and build a facility, it can't be a city-run facility. That's that's not not plausible, it doesn't happen anymore. Where the cities build hospitals and community hospitals, it doesn't happen. Um, there's no money for it, and there's no insurance and liability that will ever cover it anymore. So when you look at it, if you know a business that wants to come here, please have them contact us. We can work through our contacts at Mita, and we got a nice guy that we know there, as well as at GPAC and other places to work on helping them find the funding and the land they need. So we're always happy to help. No ifs or buts about it, I agree. I lost both of my parents, one in 15 and one in 17 to dementia, like that. Dad went in six months. Mom went over the course of about five years. They moved in with me for the last seven years of their life. So I do agree, we do need it. And we're working on it. Again, as he said, we have it coming at Copper Sky. But there also is a few homes here that actually do take care of uh, seniors. Uh, it's been a while, obviously, since 2015 when I really looked into it and decided to move my parents in. But there's about four or five homes here uh, and they do take care of uh, seniors. So there is a few homes available for that. All right, folks, uh, any questions?
Army. She already had them. Oh, okay, okay. Come in your way. Yeah, I'm just teasing. Yeah, he's been up all the time. Good evening, I'm Jelani Ellis. Um, this question is more for the yellow. A while back, uh, Arizona passed laws so the dispensaries would come here without having a medical license. I spoke on that. The city I live in, you guys didn't listen to the people who voted to have it. You know, I put it in place to where it would be difficult for it to come. Um, the only person, to my knowledge, that voted for it, even though he personally doesn't know it, is really great, is Man, Freddy, the rest of the, you all just completely ignore what the people voted for and voted against it. Say they were talking about it, coming back, and they never brought it back. And I'm yet to see where they were hearing from you, talking about it, or bring it back, and stuff like that. I'm person that, uh, I don't say the suffering because I call it a superpower. So one of my, one of my three superpowers I have is PTSD. This is my clothing brand right here. My, and one of my, med the only medication I take is because all the rest of it, even when it comes to even better if it's on my it doesn't really do anything in form at all. And there's VAs around here that veterans go to and alcohol really messes them up. But no one's banning alcohol. I don't see guys doing anything in place or even talking about kids getting alcohol with kids and still drinking it. Like that, I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys hear about it because there's been a lot of accidents on a three foot stem from our children being involved in alcohol, I don't see none of the council members or anything like that trying to do anything about the alcohol. So the medication for us, like myself, Veterans, civilians who need the medication, not just for to be smoking it, but we have to need the medication. We have to vote for it, and you all are denying it, except for Minnesota. So I wanted to see what what you're pointing that down, or even to deny it, votes or something like that. No problem. First of all, none of us voted yes, or none of us voted no. You read the headline that says council blocks dispensary. No, we called a timeout. We never voted on this. There was no vote on this. We didn't have all the rules of the game. We said, we're gonna stop, we're gonna wait. I can tell you myself, I have no problem with the dual dispensary coming in. Absolutely none. That means medical and recreational. As a, as a dual, not just a recreational or just a medical. I believe we should have both recreational and medical here. So there was no vote on this. We spoke about it. I was very vocal about just not having a recreational one. I agree 100% with that. But a medical one and a, and, a, and a recreational one, no problem. So there was no vote on that. I don't. You read the headline in, in the monitor. It said, "Council blocks dispensary." We didn't block anything. We haven't had any permits come to us. If a permit comes to us and it's in an area that works for us in the aspect of away from schools, then we have no problem with with the dispensary. Not at all. They have to have a medical, have to have a medical license, right? Medi both medical and recreational. Both. Okay. Surrounded to see everyone around us, like Casper. I can go to Casper and they have a recreational there, they don't have to have a medical license. Okay, but 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 but, but what I'm saying is this, we, we voted to have it recreational as an entire state. No, 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 no,
right? They went and had a voter referendum that allowed for recreational marijuana dispensaries. Pretty simple. And years ago, we had a referendum and we allowed medical marijuana, right? So we had medical marijuana dispensaries were allowed in the state of Arizona. And all those licenses got put out there and people opened medical dispensaries. And then, just a few years ago, recreational was voted in. So in the state, in the city of Maricopa, what we did is we simply piggybacked, right, on what we had in place for medical marijuana, and we said if you wanted to open a recreational marijuana dispensary, you couldn't do it as a standalone. It had to be done as a medical slash recreational. So that's why um, it's it sort of comes off as it was banned. Because it's not technically banned, you can open it, but you'd have to have a lot more money. So I was actually just talking to our city manager about it, and we had a conversation, and it's something that we did promise at the time to talk a little bit more about it and bring it back, and we're still looking at doing so. So what, what I suggest is pretty simple, that if you want to open a medical dispensary, you open one. You get your license from the state, you, you apply, you open one. If you want to open a recreational one, you open one. Um, but you don't need both licenses to do so. And I said at the time, so when the vote, and the only vote we had was to allow it to open with a medical. So you'd have to have both. So I said at the time, and it's like, if, if you consider a recreational license a cupcake, right? Um, it's like if you're trying to open up a cupcake store, we're requiring them to open up a nonprofit bread factory to go with it. Right? And I just want to sell cupcakes, which is the recreational, but you can't because you have to have both. And it does cost a lot of money. And there's a very limited amount of <coughs> medical marijuana dispensary licenses in the state, and there's no new ones coming anytime soon. But there are recreational ones coming soon, um, and they'll come filtering out as they um, are awarded, awarded, oh, that was Jersey right there, did you hear that? Um, as they're awarded, awarded to people. So, that's all, we just got to split it. And then when we split it to allow medical, to allow recreational, that will allow for it to open up. So it's just a, a procedural thing we're gonna have to go through as a city council, if the city council approves. Make sense? Thanks. <laughs> Next question, Anybody got any questions? Tina. Tina, okay. Uh, she's going on apartments. Oh boy. There you go. First, I would like to clarify that I am that HOA president, and it was neither of these two candidates nor Henry Wade who made the comment about just staying off Florida Road. So, for my wonderful residents who have been learning a lot about city processes, I want to make that clarification. My question is you talked about being on the zoning, changing the zoning. We put together a general plan voted by the residents. In that, there were certain areas zoned for commercial, zoned for public, zoned for this. In the past two years, the majority of apartment complexes have come right near Glen Wild and Santa Rosa Springs, and every one of them, pretty much except the original one, had to have the general plan and zoning changed. The excuse that we were given and lectured about it at the one council meeting, which I thought was terrible that so many residents spoke about it, and they were kind of spoken to in a condescending tone, is that, well, we have plenty of industrial space in the city, we put out an article about it, we do all of that, but yet part of the problem we don't get industrial or big employment is the lack of infrastructure on all of those outside areas. I know there's a law they tried to pass this year, didn't get passed. Another reason that you used for doing this is because you're afraid the law is coming. Whether it's coming or not, we voted for general plan, we voted for zoning. I believe that that should be taken into consideration along with the concerns of the residents. I would like to know, without being lectured, how you explain that to us. 
It's a good question. It's a great question, actually, because there's a lot of confusion about general planning, zoning, and all that all, all that's involved, right? Because when you vote for a general plan, you consider, oh, that's it. But legally, it can be changed, right? Legally, you can change zoning ordinances. You can change the code. You can change a plot of land from X to X. You can do that. Um, and home, uh, landowners know that, right? They buy land and they, they have an idea for that land. A lot of times they'll apply for the change before they even close on the land, right? Because they won't close if they can't get the change they want, right? And that's the thing you've seen at Iron Point. I think Iron Point, I think is the name? Um, they don't even own the land yet, right? And they're working to make sure that they can build the apartment co complex there before they actually close on it, right? So they're gonna come and they're gonna work with the actual owner now and, and do that. So there's, there's a process in place to make changes, right? And they follow that process. So we could, we really could, we can go out there and say, no, you cannot change. We are gonna leave that as commercial. We could do that. Um, we'll wind up usually in court um, because they just spent five million, ten million. They're gonna or the or the landowner that hasn't yet gotten paid for their land yet now is finds their land to be not usable for what they want. So we'll probably wind up in court. Over time, we'll probably lose the case anyway, and we'll lose money and time, and we'll grow a reputation which we just got rid of actually, a reputation with the developing community of Arizona as hard to work with. That was Maricopa. So over the last 10 years when you say, how come this didn't get built? How come that didn't get built? How come this didn't get built? It's because we had to beg developers to just look at us again. Because they were coming here wanting to build stuff and we as a city made it hard for them to build stuff. It wasn't on purpose. It wasn't like we were trying to be mean. It's just that our codes, our old zoning codes were bad. Right? It's just that we had a mentality that we were going to not work with developers, I guess. I don't know what it was. But there's been a, a, a shift over the last 10 years or so where you know, Mayor Price has been in there and working and, and we've been working to bring in development. You had that really bad um, economy, a bad crash. You know, we had houses sitting there with the windows broken and, and they were horrible and they got torn down recently, just a couple of years ago and now there's new houses being built on that land, right? So that happened and developers got scared of working with Maricopa because you come in, you invest hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars and then you're told no. And that's not, how, that's not how you work with people. So I understand that People don't want apartments where they don't want apartments. I understand that, believe me, I do. Um, I did not like the idea of a five-story apartment complex in the city of Maricopa. You can talk to some of my council members. I was very opposed to it, and I spoke to our city manager, I spoke to the developer, and I learned that that apartment complex is gonna be better than if we denied the five stories because we would have lower apartment stories, right? Three story buildings with much less amenities and we'd have a very vanilla apartment complex. And then this apartment complex that will go in, it'll be upscale and it'll have a lot of amenities. Everything from putting greens to pickleball and all the stuff that people want. So there's a process in place and as, when the developer follows the process and they legally follow the process, it's hard just to say no. There's a process and they're legally following it. And for us to just say no, we'll wind up like a company, I'm like, oh, not company, a city like maybe Fountain Hills, where they, they said no, no, no so much that they wound up in court a lot, right? And now there's apartments there because they had to force it on them. And our state legislature this year alone, this year, there was a bipartisan effort. Just imagine that, our state legislature, bipartisan. That doesn't happen very often. There was a bipartisan effort to take the zoning authority from cities and leave it in the state's hands. Meaning that somebody could go into Glenwild and buy 10 houses in a square, rip them down, and put in affordable housing. If they called it affordable, they could put it anywhere. That was a bill that was being proposed in our state legislature that we had a fight tooth and nail to kill 
But you know what happens in the legislature? Nothing dies. A bill is like a cockroach, right? It sits there. And so what they did is they changed the bill from that law to be a committee. And now they're meeting with developers, with legislators. It's funny, there's no local um, cities involved in this committee. But in that committee, they're discussing a better way to bring that bill to us next year. So it's coming because they truly do believe they know what's best for us. So sadly, we have to work so that we can show that we're working with developers to bring in the housing and the diversified housing that people need. And we do need it. You know, if you have a fireman coming to the city of Maricopa, you're gonna make $50,000, $60,000, right? You need, it's hard to buy a house, especially if you're just out of college or a teacher. It's impossible to buy a house as a teacher, $50,000, $54,000, I think is starting salary. I think it just went up a little bit. But to buy a house is hard. We have 84 teachers this year alone that are called, that are foreign teachers. That means they come here for the school year. They'll be here for this school year that's coming up and they need a place to live. Apartments are needed, you know, so we need them. So we have to work to make sure they're the best available apartments and we don't wind up with a bill out of the legislature that really hurts us because we don't want, we don't want to have how, um, apartment complexes built in the middle of, of Rancho because there's six or seven different houses they built and just wipe them out. I hope that makes sense. Do you have anything they got to Uh Probably not, except for, <laughs> unfortunately, I think he covered the whole entire basis for the next three meetings. But the bottom line is yes, it all comes down to, unfortunately, if we say no, we'll be in court. And I don't think that's the best way to spend taxpayer dollars. I do feel pain. I do feel pain because I'm going to have one when Cobblestone decides to have, well, when we decide to put uh, the throughway through the backside of Cobblestone. Believe me, I'm going to have to feel the pain because I live in Cobblestone and I know my people are not going to be happy, even though it's probably going to be roughly a, a quarter mile to a half mile away from the houses. So, but the bottom line is, is that it does come down to lawsuits and it's a difficult thing. So, hope that answers. Any, any, any uh, question? Anybody have to spoke yet? Oh. <laughs> there you go. When's the water park coming? You got it. Uh, when they get the water, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 we do have enough water, so I just want to clear that so no one understands. Uh, it's, it's, it's happening. Obviously, they're in the permit process. It's a huge process. If you could, I could just tell you, just building a hospital with six inch pipes, these guys are going to have, uh, and I just built a car wash, same thing. These pipes are unbelievable. Timing, financial is part of the issue right now. The, the equipment's just not available. So that's part of it, but also, again, planning and planning the whole thing out. But it's coming. It's coming. It's a done deal. So, yep. and it, by the way, I want to make sure we all understand it's a wave park. Okay, it's not going to have big slides and all this. It's going to have waves, three wave pools. It's going to have a lazy river around it. It's going to have a boardwalk that goes up the middle of it. It's got actually restaurants on the other on the back side. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. So, yeah, and it's also going to have sandy beaches. So you won't have to go anywhere anymore. <laughs> all right, guys, I got a uh, Facebook question from uh, Telly O'Neill. Uh, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue that our town faces that the council can change? And what role will you play in making that change happen? No ifs or buts about it, it's economic development. That is one thing that is a game changer for us. It's happening. As Vince said, over the overpass, there's going to be several stores that you guys are all going to enjoy shopping at. The husbands may not be happy, but it's going to be a great place to shop. Uh, it's going to have a variety of stuff. It'll have some restaurants. It'll have some, uh, yeah, you get it. I just can't tell you what they are. The bottom line is, is that economic development is what's going to make the city grow. But again, if you owned a business, would you bring a business if there wasn't people to come into your store? No. But now we're getting to those numbers. We're around roughly 70,000 people. Uh, unfortunately, years ago it used to be 50,000, and then when the um, crash happened, they raised it up. It's like roughly 70, 75,000 people. So it's coming. That's one thing that we are working on is economic development. That is something we can make a game changer on. I'm not going to talk about the 347 because you already know. Okay, 
but it's on our radar. Economic development is definitely number one. And along with economic development, public safety. Public safety brings economic development. I'll say it over and over again. It, it, it all comes back to it. You're not gonna bring a business to an unsafe city. We have the fourth safest city in the state of Arizona, 91 cities and uh, towns, and we're the 15th overall in the country. That tells, that's, that speaks volumes to businesses here in the state or out of state, they wanna bring their businesses here because they know they're gonna come here and they're gonna be protected and they're gonna be safe. And we're gonna continue to do that for them. Great points, economic development, um, public safety, both very important to us, but transportation, and everybody thinks of 347, which is the number one transportation issue. And I know a lot of people online will say, there's nothing the city council can do, but there is. There's the hard work and determination that we put forward to fix the 347, and that counts. A lot of that counts. But there's Transpass, which is gonna take you off the 347 before you get into town, go west on, on the Gila River land, cut across Green Road, and that's where the water park is going, right? So in there, the Green Road bypass will then go over the tracks with its own overpass over the tracks into Maricopa Meadows, and you will be able to come into the city of Maricopa and go all the way to the south side of Maricopa, the south part of Maricopa, without having to be on the 347, or John Wayne Parkway, as it's called in town. Because as you know, if you get on there sometimes, you're in trouble. There's a lot of cars. So we'll take and it'll alleviate the pressure on that road, getting people off of it. But it also gets people off that road because there'll be stores along these roads. Because there'll be, there's running, they're running out of room on the 347. There's nowhere else to build the stores, right? So when you look at it, there'll be stores on the new roads. There'll be stores that are going on the east-west corridor that's gonna take you down towards Castle Grand to the 10, right? Uh, Sonoran Desert Parkway now it's called. So a lot of people I've heard are saying, well, why would I go south to go north? And if you work or, or going somewhere on the east side of the valley, it'll be faster. If you just Google it today, it's about a 15 minute difference. And that's before there's a, an entire parkway put in, right? Just right now, it's about a 15 minute difference to get to Mesa Gateway um, Airport from Tortosa. Right? It's a 15 minute difference going down um, Casper Grand Highway and up towards the 10. Once it's a four lane highway or parkway, sorry, um, it'll be actually much faster than that. So there's gonna be help and transportation within the city. That's why um, the biggest part of our, um, our budget is, is used on transportation infrastructure um, building. So transportation. All right, guys, I've got a, uh, another Facebook question. This time it's about water. Uh, Bobber Brown would like to know if the city has ever checked with local water to make sure that they are able to keep up with the housing growth to uh, continue the supply to the residents. Yes. Sit back down. Um, but yes, no, we work with Global Water hand in hand to make sure that we there, there is the ability to bring water to the houses that are coming to the city of Maricopa, right? If you don't have an assured water supply, you can't build houses. It's really that simple. I did a post about it yesterday, I believe it was, and I, I gave the, the the link where you can click on it. So go to my, go to my Facebook page, VincentManFreddy.com. Um, click on it and you'll see how we have an assured water supply for the city of Maricopa. But it doesn't say the city of Maricopa, it calls Santa Cruz Water Company, which is a little water. So everybody's like, I don't see Maricopa, because we don't own a water company. Santa Cruz Water Company does. So you'll see that we have a 100 year water supply. We have the water available for the houses that we are building. We actually use about 7,000, it's a little over that now, about almost 8,000 acre feet of water. We have the availability to use 22,000 acre feet of water in the city of Maricopa. We're fine, we have enough water. Farmers, on the other hand, don't. And when you look at it, I know that sounds horrible, but it's true. Farmers don't rely on the groundwater, they rely on water that comes in from the Colorado River and other um, irrigation ways. So when you look at it, farmers are, are are gonna be hurting in the state of Arizona throughout the entire state, which is why you see farmers selling a whole lot of land, and then you see developers coming in and buying that land. And if you realize that on an acre of land, if you put four, eight, even 10 or 16 houses on it, it uses, and by houses I mean apartments too. So if you put that on it, it uses less water than a farm. That's true. 
So we have the water supply. We are fine right now. We can almost triple the size of the city of Maricopa without any real issue. Um, but the good news is we're not relying on that. We work in the city of Maricopa to make sure that we're addressing those needs today. By working with Global Water and working with Ron and John and talking to them and, and working to recycle our water. So there was another thing I put out there just recently is how we use about what is it, 119 whatever gallons per, I don't know what it's called, but there's a, a phrase for it. It's gallons per person per year or whatever it is. We use less water than almost anyone else in the state of Arizona for the city of Maricopa per person. And it's because we have a water company that puts a, a, a strong push on recycling the water and reclaiming the water. And some of that water now, we're gonna be working on pushing it back into the ground to replenish our aquifer. Right. So it's that kind of stuff and that's that kind of ingenuity between global water and the city of Maricopa that we're working on and we're looking towards the future. So we're not just like, drink it up, who cares? You know, we are working very hard with Global Water to make sure that we are a great place to live for many years to come. But it's not cheap. It's not. When you recycle water, it's not cheap. When you put that water in the ground, the machinery that you need, it's not cheap. When you, when you um, make sure that um, the water coming out of the houses is then brought around and recycled and reprocessed, none of that is cheap. And in other places, they don't do that. So you can get cheaper water, right? Because you don't have to worry about what happens afterwards. But here we worry about what happens afterwards. And years from now, when, you're, when you have water here and we don't have rationing and you're like, oh my God, this is pretty cool. And you look at other cities and they're in trouble. I don't think you'll mind the, what is it? $100, I think, but what we pay each month before you can use water. But it's not cheap to do what we do here. Thank you. Rich. Do you have anything there? Uh, probably not, but I'm just going to say that you covered every basis. Uh, you asked about the water park. Do you wonder why Casa Grande doesn't have a water park? <clears throat> or development. Because they don't have the water. We do. We do work very closely with uh, Global Water. So the answer is yes. And the answer about everything I possibly could have thought of or said. So. The answer is yes, we do work with them. We have very, in, in simple terms also, we have very big straws that go down very deep. And we have an aquifer below us with plenty of water, so. Sorry, can't give you more than that. All right, guys, uh, I guess I got a question, uh, a topic of my own to bring up. Today, uh, Governor Ducey uh, yeah. vetoed a, uh, a, a roads tax in Maricopa County that was going to, in part, uh, pay for improvements on 347 north of Riggs Road. And I wanted to know what you guys think about that, and is there anything we can do at this point, or what next? Thank God he's gone. So that's probably the easiest thing. We don't have much more to deal with him, obviously. So the bottom line is, is that we can continue to push, we can continue to push. Believe me, when we get something set on our minds as a council, we bombard them with letters. We bombard them with emails. We show up on their doors. We will continue to do that because this is crazy. This is money that we all need to get things done. Every year we go to DC and people say, what do you go to DC for? We go to DC to beg for money. Okay, I'm just gonna keep it down to simple terms here. Exactly. So the bottom line is, is that as a team, we're gonna to continue to do what we did. It's the same thing with the redistricting. We had a leader in this one. She knows who she is. She did a great job. She made sure, Nancy Smith, uh, that we were able to make sure that we didn't leave anybody out in Maricopa, okay? So when we put something on our minds, we get it done. There's a lot of things on our minds and we're gonna to continue to push for that. But yeah, that sucks. There's nothing we can do right this second. He's going to be gone. We don't have to worry about him come November. The state of the city a couple years ago, um, Christian talked about grit, right? And how we have to show grit. And it seems to happen a lot for the city of Maricopa because just when we think we're there, we get knocked down. And then we have to get back up. We have to fight again. And we have to fight again and we have to fight again. And that's where we're at right now, because just when we thought 
We had our $90 million, because that's what was in that. $90 million for the city of Maricopa to expand the 347 on the Maricopa side. So you, as you know, half of it, more than half of it is in Maricopa, the 347, no. and the other, Maricopa County, and the other, other part of it is in Pinal County. So Pinal County wrote tax that you're gonna vote on in November, and please vote for it. I know everybody says, oh, it's horrible, I don't wanna pay more tax, it's a half cent sales tax. Please vote for it in November if we need it, because if that doesn't happen, then we're really screwed when it comes to 347. Really, I'll tell you in a second. Um, so that'll be in November. So what happened is Maricopa County, for some odd quirk in the world, has to ask the legislator, legislature's permission to put a sales tax for transportation on the ballot. Pinal County doesn't. Pinal County, the supervisors can say, hey, we're gonna have a sales tax, half cent sales tax. They put it on the ballot and the people, us, we vote for it. And that's gonna be on the November ballot. It's a half cent sales tax that'll be used for transportation. Pretty nice. In Maricopa County, they have to get the permission from the legislature and the governor to do it. So the legislature went ahead and they passed it. And they passed it by a very slim margin, but it passed. And then the governor said, nah, so fast. And he said, I'm gonna veto it. And he vetoed it. But the problem is he didn't say I'm gonna veto it until he got everything else he wanted out of the legislature. And the budget passed and the legislature signed, he died, they're done, they're gone. And then he vetoed it. Screwing the people over that needed the most. And that's us. Because in that legislation, that if it would have passed in Maricopa County to expand, not, not add a sales tax, it's just keep it in place, because they currently have it in place. So this was an extension. $90 million for the 347. That's what we had sitting in that. And Ducey with the pen said, you cannot have that $90 million. So next year, the legislature will have to pass it again. The new governor, whoever he or she may be, right? Um, at that point, can then approve it or not. But what it does, it puts us a year, at least a year, behind right now. At least. Fun and exciting stuff, everybody. But as we get knocked down in the city of Maricopa, we rise up and we keep fighting. So we'll have to speak to our federal government, we'll have to speak to the states, we'll have to work and push and push and push. And Teresa Martinez, our current representative, will work with us. She will work with us, and she, just like she did this year alone, by getting $900,000 to do some fixes on the 238, by bringing $11 million to bringing the lanes on the Pinal County side. Not enough, but it's a start. The, the, the tax that you see in November will bring more. And then, of course, bringing nearly nine, uh, sorry, uh, $14 million to help with the cost, no, 11, $11 million to help with the cost of the overpass at Riggs Road. Because remember, we passed an overpass at Riggs Road for $35 million last budget. Brett Roberts did that, right? He gave us $35 million in the state budget, and we all said, hooray! And then we, decide, we found out he had enough money. So we went back and we got $11 million for that. So now we have $46 million for the Riggs Road overpass over the 347. So it's that kind of work by our legislature, by us as city council, by pushing forward the help we need that's gonna pay off. So it's just true grit. Quick follow-up question. Uh, this is from Steve uh, Hunzinger on Facebook. Uh, is the plan for the, uh, the overpass, does this in any way change the plan for the overpass at Riggs Road? Oh, no, I just, as I just mentioned, it doesn't change it, right? Because the Riggs Road overpass is budgeted money in the state budget, which is really good. Because if you just get money somehow, it's not in the state budget, right? What happens is it could change. But once it's identified in the state budget, it has to be spent within three years. So the $35 million has to be spent on that project within the next three years. And we have to spend money now on it. So this year coming up is the design standards for it. And then, of course, the next part is going to be the construction. We're out looking for design and for construction now. So it's being bidded out on the street right now. So the Riggs Road overpass, the Ducey um, veto has nothing, doesn't impact it. And he also wants to know whether uh, 
the kind of interchange it's going to be as change, whether it'll be an overpass or maybe a diamond interchange. Diamond interchange is on the I. You want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, the overpass is just going to be a simple overpass. Yeah. The diamond exchange will be at the 10 that will start with, will go with the whole entire project as it goes down the line. So it's a piece by piece, unfortunately. We'd love to have $280 million, probably $300 million to fix the whole thing at once. And by the way, in construction, that's probably going up, it's roughly a million dollars a mile. Now, with inflation and the way things are going, it's probably more like $5 million a mile. So it's so important to get these things passed now because by the time you get them built, the price can continue to, could double. So that's why it's so important for the half cent sales tax, Maricopa County, and let's get a new governor who's going to say yes for the people. Any uh, questions in the room? So as, a, as you know, I uh, chair the uh, city board of investments, and which we've served on before. Um, I've been kind of surprised say, when, uh, with all the new developments and growth, I kind of anticipated more uh, uh, cases going to us. For those who don't know, the uh, board of adjustments, um, we're a quasi-judicial uh, committee appointed by the, the board, and we uh, address things that go, they're not, um, I guess, addressed uh, or agreed upon in the zoning, during the, in the zoning uh, committees, right? And uh, so my question is, is the uh, zoning just doing a really good job in addressing it and so there's nothing coming to the Board of Adjustments or is the city um, staff doing anything different working with the zoning? Um, and is there any plans in the future with the uh, Board of Adjustments? Because you know we don't meet very often. Um, so I don't know if there are any future plans for the Board of Adjustments and that kind of process with zoning. So I was also on Board of Adjusters uh, before I was elected. Yes, we work with, obviously, zoning is one of the things. Majority of the time, the, the Board of Adjustments comes up with uh, any of the things is things that happen in people's homes and changes that's obviously you know. Uh, I had to meet with the Board of Adjustments myself because my house was built on 42% of the land. And in the city of Maricopa, that's all you could have. Matter of fact, so I went to them, I spoke to them, I had plenty of land, I wanted to build uh, extend my patio out. I wanted to put a patio outside of that because my push my patio out. So I had to meet with them and I had to talk with them about it and I had to send them what I was doing. And because I had 42% of my land covered, I needed to ask for 3% more, plus they gave me a 2% allowance. So they actually changed the code for that because most houses in the city of Maricopa are built on 42% of their land that they currently sit on. So guess what? That means you couldn't build a patio or nothing on it. As for the future of it, uh, it's been in discussions that uh, whether we're going to move it into uh, another part of the city or, but over the course of the four years that I've been on and prior, I've had one case and that was mine. <laughs> so I can't say that we're, it's, is it necessary? Uh, it's nice to have a, a, another opinion. So we'll continue to talk about it and see if it's, if it, if it needs to be changed or no change. Yeah, I covered it mostly. I served on board adjustment too, and it's the same comment, right? It's it, it serves a purpose, but it might it might actually have a hearing officer instead that can do the same purpose and frees up the people that are sitting on zoning and um, I'm sorry on board of adjustments to do other things for the city instead of just sitting there on the board of adjustment never meeting. Right? I served on board of adjustment, and one year we met once in a year. In a year, at once, because there was no need. And basically, what Gary said, if you didn't hear it, Board of Adjustment is when planning and zoning says no to something, you can appeal it to the Board of Adjustment, right? So, but our staff does a great job working with developers before it even goes to planning and zoning. So, a lot of the stuff that would get declined is already told to the developer, hey, it's gonna get declined, don't do that. And they, they have changed before they even get to planning and zoning. So, it really does. Um, it doesn't need very much, but it does serve a purpose, but it might actually be able to be done by a hearing officer and then leave the planning and zoning people to have different positions within the city. 
So what I'm hearing is that the staff's done a really good job working yes. before, so it doesn't even have to come to us. Yeah, so staff does a great job, and planning and zoning. We have really great people on planning and zoning that really do study and work through with, and then push back on developers. And instead of, instead of a developer saying, no, I want to do it, the developer listens to planning and zoning, goes back, and brings it back with the changes they suggest. So it, that that's a big part of it, too. All right, guys, I got another question from a Facebook viewer, or a Karen Markell. What are you going to do about the parking on neighborhood roads? There are so many runners on my street, and they probably have about three cars per house. And no one parks in their garage. My HOA told me it was a city problem, and I need to call the city or police to address it. Guys, answers. <laughs> Uh, there's not many answers, right? Um, in some areas, they have CCNRs in place that don't allow for street parking in some HOAs. In some HOAs, they have no restrictions, right? and they'll try and do restrictions, but they can't because it's not in the CCNRs, right? So some places have a restriction, some don't. Um, there's a couple rules that the police follow, and that is you can't park the wrong way. I've done it. I've gotten in trouble for it. Um, you can't park on a certain a certain number of inches from or on the sidewalk part, and the police will give you a citation for that. But street parking is probably not going to get you a citation because it's an HOA issue, right? And the HOAs will decide um, if, and they have to decide when they basically establish their HOA. You can't really change it now because at the state legislature, they took that power and said that uh, an HOA can't now decide to restrict street parking if it wasn't in place before 2014. So it's not really a city issue. It's more of an HOA issue. And I can't talk much because I have a lot of cars in front of my house. I do. Again, it's it's one of these. There's not much we can do. Streets are are the cities, but there's not much we can do about it. I mean, again, first of all, I guess the biggest thing is people should just be considerate. If you have a driveway or you have a garage, use it. But outside of that, I can't tell my you know I got a guy who parks in front of my house every single day, and he lives on the other side of the street. I'm also a nice guy. I'm also an HOA board member, but I have to go tell him to go do this. I have no right to do that because he can park on either side of the street. Again, just a little consideration. If we all tried that, possibly we could work things out a little bit nicer, but we can't do anything about it. Uh, <clears throat> one more question. Um, I've been to a couple of forums, stuff like that. I've been here eight years. Uh, Maricopa is very, very diverse. Because I'm living in uh, different groups, so I get in Maricopa. And uh, I didn't know, Councilman Vidal, that you were actually on the um, community that does HLA and stuff like that. Um, there's a, I'm pretty sure everyone knows, you all know, there's a lot of things going on in America that's not cool at all. As a young man who's got shot at 90 times and was hit 60 times with police, a lot of police brutality. Part of uh, the reason why I had one of my superpowers is I've been a victim. Uh, I have not been shot at 90 times, but I have been a victim of police brutality and a victim of racism. Um, I haven't seen anything on the city level that reflects the diversity within the city. So I was wanting to know um, what you all do or plan to reflect as far as on the city level, the city magazine and stuff like that. Uh, you see them all, uh, all the other holidays, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, things like that. You see the flag all over. HOA has got all the flags over. Think, well, you don't see anything for Sigma Camayo and the LGBTQ, and stuff like that. Or even the hip to the church and the teachers pass, which now fill a holiday. It has its own flag, but you don't see anything like that at all. I was in Tempe a few weeks ago, and Tempe, you see that my country flags. You see the Juneteenth flag. And you saw the LGBTQ plus flag. And so in eight years, I've never seen this at all. And from what my understanding is that when it comes down to the HOAs, I did see on June they did put up the American flag on June T, but then I saw it really was taken down. So I was wondering, being that your council and the diversity and stuff like that, um, have you ever suggested anything like that? And what do you guys do to on to show the other groups in Maricopa that are not white that you love? Well, we, we started a new, um event this year with the cultural event 
that was absolutely amazing. So yes, we have a big diversity here in the city. And you know, again, I don't know if there's a flag for Juneteenth. Uh, again, I, I can't specifically say, but we are diverse. We have no issues with what's going on with whatever group is out there. We have no problem with any of that stuff. I think we have zero racial issues in this city, zero. Now, as for somebody getting shot a whole bunch of times, wrong. I don't believe in some of this police brutality. But again, for public safety wise, our cops are fantastic. I have not heard anybody complain about our cops taking advantage of whether they're black, white, green, purple, pink, man, woman, I don't care. What I care about is to make sure that our police officers treat everybody with respect. But as for the diversity, I think we're one of the few cities that are continuing um, working with different groups. The cultural event was amazing. So as for me, as to have flags for this, that, or another thing, it's not a bad idea. But again, that would have to be brought up to each individual HOA, and they would decide what they want to particularly do. But as a city, I think we're pretty diverse. I think we have plenty of, uh, you know, we have the um, Cinco de Mayo, we have the new cultural fair, which is everything, which I think is amazing to have everybody, all the different cultures under one, um, in one um, facility, which we do and we'll be doing every single year now after this. It's a, it's, it's a hard question, it's a good question. It's a question that has to be asked and answered a lot. Um, so what does the city do specifically for individual groups of people? And the reality of it is almost nothing. Um, and you have to rely on doing something for everyone. And I know that sounds like all lives matter and stuff like that, right? But when you look at it, you have to help everyone. And from that, you can help individuals. So, you know, I didn't know there was a Juneteenth flag, but now there's one sitting on my desk I just purchased and I'll put it up next year. Um, so when you look at it, it's a learning experience for everyone. And this is one of the most diverse cities in the state of Arizona. Yes, city of Maricopa, it's one of the most diverse cities. We have everyone here. So we have to accept that within ourselves. And unfortunately, I don't believe there's zero racism in, in Maricopa, there's racism in everything. Um, and it's, it's, it's an unknown or an unfelt racism that, you, that happens, right? It's the belief that you have. I've dealt with it, I've spoken to people and I've heard from them and I'm like, holy crap, right? And you don't wanna deal with that person, you walk away from that person because you hear some really stupid and ignorant things. So there, there is racism, right? And it's how you work to make sure you address it. And you address it by working together as a community bring everyone together. So the multicultural event is a great one because it's multicultural and it should be everybody together celebrating together because when you come together, you're not pulling apart. So I don't believe in segregation. I don't believe in pulling apart into different areas, but I am not a black man in America. So I don't know how you feel in the city of Maricopa. I don't know how you feel in the, in the United States or in Arizona, I don't know. But that's why I've asked you before, tell me and talk to me. Let me tell you real quick. I know. <laughs> real quick scenario, we have all parents in here real quick, so you all say about the all lives matter, we do things for everyone. So in your household, in your household you have children. Let's just say for some of us who have blended households, not just a black and white house or whatever, just blended households completely as a whole. So let's say you have a kid that you, your wife you had and you marry into another wife, she has a kid, so now you have a stepchild, stepson, stepkids. So you in this house, because I, I believe you guys were the house, the city council are the parents. So there are certain kids in the house that come with that get everything, because those are your kids that came from you. But then there's other ones that don't get the same attention at all. So you see you see stuff that reflects your children that you have. So you have the Memorial Day, you have the Veterans Day, you have that. But you don't have anything that reflects LGBTQ at all. So that doesn't, so it's not a specific group, but that specific group lives here and nothing reflects them at all, period. There's a, there's a very, very large African-American group here. 
No reflection in the city of Maricopa at all for the large African American group here. No reflections for the LGBTQ plus group here at all. At all, none of us ever have not seen that one council member attend an African American uh, um, event. I've had Juneteenth here. I brought Juneteenth here to the city of Maricopa because the cultural, cultural affairs committee didn't want me on it and there's, there's nothing about it at all, period. So I started on my own. I just don't talk it, I do it. So I started, done four years. Oh, there's only one city council member on the board and since I've been here for eight years. So in eight years, only one city council member has ever came to that, that event. That's now a federal holiday. So again, you don't have to specifically do anything, but if I'm a child within your city, but I'm being neglected. So I'm just a step kid. But you know I was there. So as a black man in America, yeah, I live here, so as a black man in America, and part of my superpower of PTSD is because of the racism that I see every single day on television and experience, and these are my city council members that don't speak about it, don't say nothing about it, don't address it, I have not, Nancy Smith, no one, no one has said anything about Juneteenth or anything has to do with anything other than veterans or a what is considered an American holiday, which is a reflection of white America, not black or any, any other ethnicity group. So that, that is what I mean about, and what it is, and that's what it feels like to be about being a black in America, a black man in America, is being alienated in America, especially in my city. I've been here for eight years, and no one has done nothing at all for any other group, not just a black group, but LGBTQ plus and everything else. E even even the, 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 the social media that reflect Maricopa, that reflects you all, talks a lot of shit about blacks and LGBTQ plus. They were afraid to even come to my event because people are talking crazy on there and no city council members at all speaks up for those children. What about them? What about us? Well, first of all, I, I'd like to let you know that I have Mexican children. I have white children. I have a granddaughter who's black. I have a gay um, uh, nephew, my first boy nephew. So. I, I, I have no prejudice against anybody. I don't care what color you are, have you ever seen what you are. Have you ever to have something that reflects that your other children in the city? No, I, I've only been on one year. But so you're 100% right. I'm not, I'm not. I, I want to know what are you doing, no, what are you planning on no. doing for the, for the rest of us that feel like me? Because I'm not the only one, I'm just the only one up here talking about it. Right? I understand, I so understand. What, what do but, you all plan on doing even next year's federal holiday? It was like it wasn't even a paper. None of you even spoke about it. the federal holiday of Juneteenth. You, Nancy Smith, the only person I was there was Wade. And okay, guys, we we've got to move on to another topic. Yeah, we move to another topic as usual, especially when it comes to that. The question is uh, should we stop building houses? And this is from uh, Cindy Perryborn. Uh, from Facebook, should we stop building houses until the infrastructure catches up? Well, like you said, we've talked about infrastructure is very important. The answer is no. The reason why we stop building houses, we stop bringing people, you stop getting what you want. Plain and simple. It's math. Okay? If a Home Depot came here today or a couple years ago, think about this. We'll call it when we're at 50,000 people. 50,000 people in a home. The average family has three people. Let's say that you've got uh, or four people in a home. Two of those kids, two of those parents. So now we just cut that 50,000 to 25,000. Two of them are the adults. Generally, only one adult is going to shop, probably at a Home Depot. So now you just went down to 12, 12 and a half uh, thousand people. I don't know about you, but if we only had 12 and a half thousand people going to shop at a Home Depot, it would be out of business. And we don't want that to happen. So, no, if we stop building houses, we stop building apartments, we are working on the infrastructure. But if you want restaurants, Home Depots, Targets, or whatever it is that you want, they are not going to come here for 50, 60, 70,000 people. They're not going to do it. Again, I'll go back to Casa Grande. Yes, Casa Grande has less than us now, but when they had their Home Depot and they had their Lowe's and everything else that came there, they had the infrastructure at the particular time, they also had the people there. Because remember, not only do they draw from Casa Grande, they draw from Eloy, Florence, Arizona City, so they have other draws. So probably their draw is over about 100,000 people. 
who's going to come from who's going to come from Chandler to here to come to our Home Depot? Casa Grande has one, so why are they going to come here? So again, they need the people here. It's just a, it's just a financial decision. I'm not going to open up a business like that and only have twelve thousand people walk through my door. The average Walmart averages ninety thousand people walk through their door a day. The average. Now, obviously, we don't have that here in Maricopa because we don't have ninety thousand people. But that's the average. I dealt with Walmart for many, many years. Think about it. 90,000 people walk through that door in bigger cities. That's how they can stay alive. That's how they can come here. You know, a good thing about um, retail here in the city of Maricopa is that when a store opens here, it breaks every record for that, right? that store. Just look at the Wendy's when it opened and they had to have the refrigerator trucks outside just hauling in the meat all day. Same thing with Burger King. Same thing's happening today with Jimmy John's. I went over there and had a sandwich. Don't tell my wife I'm not supposed to go out and eat all the time. Um, but I had my sandwich at Jimmy John's. And so it, it happens. And so once they get here, they understand that this is the place to be. But they also have to make that investment. They have to make that leap and that jump in. So our job is to make sure they understand that it's here, we're here, to create a strong um, environment for them to actually come and grow. So we're working on it, but it's, and I say it a lot, development brings development, right? So development pays for development. When you look at the road at Porter Road and you see the new lanes that went in, that's because there's new houses being built at Province or else those road wouldn't be on Porter. It's that simple, it would have stayed a two lane road. When you see the roads on, on Honeycutt in front of Providence get built, that's because Providence built houses. And as houses are built, money is spent on infrastructure. So you can't just say, whoa, let's just wait for infrastructure to be built because somebody's gotta pay for it. And if it's not the developer paying for it, it's you in taxes, right? So developers are gonna pay for infrastructure improvements, not you directly. So that's how that works. So unless we want to spend a whole lot of money on, on putting infrastructure in and then hoping a development, developer comes in, it doesn't work. Development pays for development. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Rachel Paul again. Uh, this question is for both candidates and you're running for re-election. Yes. My question is, um, at first, let me say thank you uh, for the service that you guys have uh, provided thus far. And I want to also acknowledge council members that um, moving forward, Rich, you stated that you're not familiar with any type of racism or anything that's going forth in the city, to your knowledge. Vince, you did acknowledge that you are not going to say that there's zero racism. Appreciate you. Um, but here's the thing. Are you willing, because something was brought up today that I had discussions with our former uh, police chief and you know other council members. I do want to acknowledge council member Smith has been, uh, maybe not to the Juneteenth celebration, but she has actually been very proactive in attending events that are um, for the African American culture. And uh, I know for sure this year she spoke at a, a women's, a, a minority women's event that was very successful that was here. Um, but are you willing to listen to what's gone forth today and incorporate that into your next term if reelected so that there is a feeling of more inclusion instead of exclusion for those um, marginalized groups of, of people who don't feel like they have a place in America. But are you willing to, what are you willing to do if reelected? 100%, the answer is yes. Again, you are right, I have not a, a, uh, attended that. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I have or make it up. The bottom line is I'm willing to listen and learn. I'm always learning, I'm willing to learn. I'm always, like I said, my phone number's out there for anybody who wants to call me, okay? So Rachel, you've called me before. Have I not taken your phone call? Have I always called you back? Have you asked me a question? I'm always willing to listen. Again, I'm not perfect, but I am willing to sit, listen, and learn. So my answer to you, Rachel, is yes. My answer to you also is yes. I have no issue with it. Rachel, Johnny, of course, yeah. Um, when, when, I, when I say of course, yeah, is 
you can't you can't know what you're ignorant of unless you're taught sometimes and you have conversations so we met for two and a half hours in my office and we spoke and we talked and and we laughed and and we had i thought we had a good time three hours three and a half three and a half hours don't tell my partner over there he's gonna kick me for not working um but we met and we talked and we laughed and i, I almost cried at some point today and we had conversations and we, and we left that saying we all have to do better all of us and we have to understand that we are a diverse community and there has to be the 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 push to make sure that we are doing better and i made that promise to you um, and I, I intend to hold that promise because when I do make a promise, I, I keep it. Um, and I'm kind of like a bulldog with stuff. When I say I'm going to do something, I work very hard until I get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Council, I think we're going to conclude the uh, town, the uh, city council portion of this uh, of this town hall. And but I have a few more questions for the uh, school board folks from the school board candidates. They don't mind taking the floor for a few minutes. Do you want us to just wrap us up so that way, or do you want us to come back and forth? It might be easier. What do you think? Yeah, wrap actually, up. I think it'd be easier to go ahead and wrap, wrap you guys up. I'll, I'll give you, you guys each take two minutes to conclude, and uh, then your, your part will be done. Before I give you my closing, is there anybody who has anything else they want to ask us? Really? <laughs> Sweet. Anyway. It is eight o'clock. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> Council Member Rich Fidiello, like I said, I'm here interviewing for a job. I have made promises. The, men, the number one promise that I can make for you is that I will work hard. I am a hard worker. I'm up early. I work late. I'm there for you. My phone number is everywhere. I take every phone call. I will return any phone call. I will continue to make sure I do that. As I said, the only candidate who's endorsed by both fire and police because uh, public safety will bring economic development to the city. And that's just one thing that I can guarantee you that we're gonna to continue to work hard and the council is all about it. But I promise you that uh, being a father, raising children here like Vince, I wanna keep my family safe. And I know that no business is gonna come move here unless we have a safe city. And we're going to continue to get that. I want to be the number one safest city in the state of Arizona. It's a tough task, but we're going to continue to do. Again, we bounce between three and four every year. I will continue to make sure that our police officers, our firefighters, our men and women who protect us will continue to get the equipment they need to protect us. And we've got, we've shown that we've got ladder racks, we've gotten uh, vehicles that they uh, need. The bottom line is, is that I will work hard for you. I will continue to work hard for you. That's the only promise that I can honestly make to you, except that, that's it. So Rich Fidello for City Council, I want your vote for four more years to continue working for you, the people of Maricopa. Eight o'clock at night on a Thursday night, we're out here talking, answering your questions, right? Um, you know, first I'd like to say I, I'm I'm kind of worried a little bit about um, Henry and what he's going through today. And I had an opportunity to talk to him. I won't share, and he'll share with you eventually. But you know, my prayers and my my thoughts are with him today and his family. So when I look at it, there's three there's three seats on City Council right now that are up for election. It's Henry, Rich myself we're up for a re-election and there's someone else running against us i think the three of us have done a damn good job in the city of maricopa and i think the three of us have earned a re-election vote from you i really do um i don't care if you vote if i'm third place second place or first place in the ballot my goal is to represent you for the next four years and finish some of the stuff we've been working on. That's all I care about. I don't care about accolades. I don't care about anything like that. I just want to fix what I can fix and then move on. That's my goal is to make sure that we get things done. The transportation issues that we have, 
You know, I know Rich said he wants to be the number one safest city, but it's gonna be hard to be Florence. Half their people are in prison. <laughs> um, so, but it's true. I mean, your population, half the population is in the prison, so they don't count towards crime. So it's really hard to beat Florence. It's why they're number one all the time. They count the population, but not the crime. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to beat Florence and, and places that, that have prisons when it comes to safest cities. They're always number one, two, three, right? But we want to be a safe city. You know, we're both endorsed by Mayor Price. Mayor Price wants, a, uh, wants to see us back in office. You know, I look at it and we got a lot to finish up. And I'm here to do it. I'm here to work. I'm available to you. I answer your questions. I stay knowledgeable in everything I can within the city. I answer questions online, in person, in prize, in bashes. I've snuck and tried to go to, um, uh, what's the move? Oh, jeez. Uh, no, Sprouts. I've snuck and tried to go to Sprouts and nope, they get me there too. And you wind up having conversations with people that take a half an hour because you went in to get some strawberries or something. I'm there for you. I think I've done a good job. I hope I've done a good job. And I hope I've earned your vote for four more years. Thank you.